peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Growing up, I was fairly involved with sports, and specifically soccer. From when I was in about fourth grade up until just before going to the seminary, I was in different levels of competition, from rec all the way up to working into semi-pro areas. And so throughout all that competition, as you might expect, I went through a number of tryouts. As I would try to move up to a better team or switch schools, whatever the case may be, the new coaches always wanted to see you in a tryout. There are typically three stages to a soccer tryout, at least. Maybe those of you that play sports can relate. The first stage was some kind of physical fitness test. I can remember running timed miles until my head was crazy. I can remember doing ladders up and down the field for what seemed like days. But there was always this element of seeing if you had what it takes to physically play the sport before anything else took, took place. The next phase of tryouts was typically some kind of skills assessment. For soccer, a lot of times that was an agility ladder. Maybe you've seen them in the, the preseason football workouts where they dance through the ladders. Or some kind of passing drill or shooting drill to assess if I had the skills necessary to be successful on the field. And then finally, the last portion of the tryout was usually some kind of scrimmage. And this was a test of your game knowledge. Can you take your physical fitness and your skills and put them together be inserted into a team and not only be successful individually, but also help that team to success. This was always my favorite part of the tryout, not only because you got to play the game at that point, but also because there was a chance here to make up for mistakes that you had made in the other two sections. Maybe your fitness wasn't quite where it should be, but if you had the game knowledge and the positioning, you could make up for that fitness. Maybe the skills are a little bit rusty, but if you have the game knowledge and where to place yourself, the skills don't matter quite as much. Throughout all of the tryouts, there were a lot of nerves. There was a lot of emotions going on. But during the tryouts was never the worst for me. It was always before. It was always looking ahead to the tryouts. There was always this time of self-reflection, of self-analysis to say, did I prepare enough? Had I done enough? Did I do what it takes to make this team and to be successful on this team? Our gospel lesson today is something like these tryouts. And Jesus lays out three areas specifically that the disciples need to be successful in in order to become his disciples. So we'll take a look at those three areas. And the first one that Jesus talks about is the area of relationships. He says, unless you leave your father and mother, or hate your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. This is in the context of of the Good Samaritan. Just a few chapters before, Jesus has given the parable of the Good Samaritan and said the summation of the law of Moses is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Love everyone else as you love yourself. And in that context, he then turns on the crowds and says, hate your family. Hate your life. And did you catch that word? That shocking word, that very unchristian word coming from the mouth of Jesus? hate. Hate your family. This shocked me when I was preparing the sermon, and so I went back and looked at the Greek for this, thinking maybe there's a, a nuance in the translation that you can bring out, but it's very clear. This word means hate in the sense that you're thinking of it. Many of you are probably here with your families today. Take a look at them, to your left, to your right, wherever they are. Do you hate them? Are you willing to say that you hate them? I may not like my family all the time, but I wouldn't go so far as to say I hate them. Okay, so I failed this part of the tryouts of becoming a disciple, but maybe there's room for me to make up some ground. The next section is the area of reputation. Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And so reading through this, I got caught up a little bit on that bear his own cross. And what, is it, what exactly does that mean? Because I don't know about you, but I don't have a giant wooden beam that I carry around with me wherever I go. That's a little too heavy. I like to be able to move around a little bit more than that. So I looked further into this. And when you look into where bearing your cross comes into play, typically Jesus is talking about some sort of persecution, some sort of trial that people will have to go through for his sake. You see, the crosses that we wear around our necks or in our ears have tattooed on our, our wrists and ankles don't mean the same thing today that they meant back in ancient times. In ancient times, the cross was a symbol of death, humiliation, and torture. And so this would have been very forefront in the disciples' minds. 
He's essentially telling them, unless you're ready to be humiliated, tortured, and put to death for me, you cannot be my disciple. So how'd you guys do here? Are you willing to die for, for Christ? I, I don't know about you guys. I kind of like being alive. I'd like to continue living. I'm not really looking forward to being humiliated. So I, I guess I kind of fail that part too. But there's hope. There's one more section that Jesus talks about. And this is the area of possessions, the stuff, the things of this world. And he says, Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This, at least, is fairly clear. We don't have Jesus saying the big hate word. We don't have him using cryptic language like take up your cross. It's very clear. Renounce everything you have. Give everything you have away. Don't count your possessions as anything. And instead, follow me. A lot of times we talk about the love of money and how money is the root of all evil. You've probably heard that saying, right? Money is the root of all evil. Do you know that's actually a, a misquotation of scripture? 1 Timothy 6.10 says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And so he's saying, renounce the things of this world. Renounce the money. Renounce the possessions. And instead, follow me. So how'd you do? In these tryouts of being a disciple, can you say you fulfilled all three you're good to go? I'm not. I've already shared that with you. And yet I still count myself as a disciple of Christ. And I count you all as disciples of Christ as well. But how can that be? This is, this is very clear. This is an ultimatum Christ is laying out. And we fail. Well, let's look at the illustrations. Maybe that'll give us a little more, a little more talking room and see what Christ is really talking about here. And so the first one is this picture of a man who wants to build a house. And he's, he, before he builds the house, he needs to take stock of what it's going to cost. The building materials, the time involved, if he has the help that he needs, if he's able to complete it possibly before the winter comes, anything like that. He needs to look forward, take stock of what he has, and see if he's able to even finish this project before he begins. Because if he's not, he'll end up like our poor friend here, watching TV, but he has no walls when the winter comes. And people make fun of him when they walk by, and he'll be humiliated. Our second illustration is that of two armies. And there's a smaller army of about 10,000, and a larger army of 20,000 is marching on them. And the scripture says the, the commander, the king of the smaller army, first needs to take stock of whether he'll be able to oppose that greater army. Maybe he has better fortifications, walls that they can hide behind. Maybe he has better engines of war. Whatever it is, he needs to assess whether he'll be able to oppose that larger army. And if not, while that larger army is still far away, he needs to send a peace delegation to them, or else they'll be destroyed. Both of these illustrations are about taking stock before starting an endeavor. Self-reflection, self-analysis to see if you have what it takes to do what you set out to do. And so really what we're talking about today is a, a first commandment issue. The first commandment is that you should have no other gods before the one true God. But in the explanation to that, Luther says, we are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And further says that our God is what we look to for all good and where we look for refuge in every time of need. So where do you look in those hard times? When a family member suddenly becomes ill, when the job falls through or you get laid off, when the finances maybe aren't where they should be, where do you place your ultimate trust? Where do you look to in those hard times? Many of us turn to family. And that seems good, right? The fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. And yet, when our family becomes more important than God, when our family is the place we look instead of God for identity and security, Jesus is asking you to examine that and maybe rearrange those priorities in your life. Maybe when your job is more important, when the hard times come, but you have to have that job, your job is where you find your identity, your security. Your, your job has then replaced God as an idol in your life. Or maybe possessions. We all like possessions. We like to have the newest technology, the greatest thing. But when that becomes more important than going to worship on Sunday, than attending Bible classes, than an extensive prayer life, then possessions, money, things have become our idol and have taken the place of God. The disciples knew what Jesus was asking. They knew that Jesus was saying, following me means nothing less than a complete breach with the things of this world. 
He's saying we need to take our eyes off of the created things, which includes family, which includes jobs, which includes possessions, and instead focus first on the creator of all things. That's when our priorities are right. That's when we're fulfilling the first commandment and worshiping the one true God. And the disciples, when they heard this, they were shocked. They were astounded. In a similar teaching in Matthew 19, it says the disciples were, sh- were shocked to amazement, almost to speechlessness. And so they say to Jesus, we've followed you. We've given up our family. We've left our family. We've left our jobs. We've left our possessions. What more do we have to do? With these rules, with this list of becoming a disciple, who can be saved? And Jesus says in another shocking statement, with man, this is not possible. It is not possible for you to become a disciple of Christ alone. It is not possible to be saved, to get salvation alone. But he then continues on and says, but with God, all things are possible. And with God, this has already happened. In the person of Jesus Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection, our sins, our shortcomings, those times when we place things above God and set up idols in our life, are forgiven in the body and blood of Christ. Those sins are washed away like we just witnessed in baptism. We become a new person. We become a disciple of Christ. And even more than that, even more than just being a disciple, we're promised blessing after blessing for this. In Matthew 19, 29, Jesus says, Everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Not only do we have an eternal relationship with God, not only do we know that when he recreates the heavens and the earth, we'll dwell with him for eternity. But he promises that those things that we give up, those things that we sacrifice today, he returns to us a hundredfold. And so the challenge that Jesus was issuing to the disciples then is being issued to us today. Do you have what it takes to be a disciple? Do you have what it takes to put away the things of this world and instead focus on the creator? Of course, we have to answer no, we don't alone. But Jesus came through our faith in Jesus. We know that we have. And with the power of God through Jesus, we already have a spot on that team. We already are guaranteed a place. The tryouts are done. They're over. We're on that team because of the person of Jesus Christ. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.